So welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. I'm Thorin Tritter. I am the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Before we start, I want, as I have been recently saying, to emphasize that our building is open and you can come and see the objects that I've been talking about on the Curator's Corner program for over a year. You can come and see them in person. Uh, so please come to our museum. We're open Monday through Friday from 10 to 4.30 and Saturday and Sunday from 12 to 4. If you'd like to arrange a guided, a guided tour, of course, that can also be arranged. Just give us a, a week in advance. We like to set those up just so we can get the guides in place. So I hope you'll come and visit our museum. I also want to encourage you before I start, as I always do, to pose any questions that you may have in the Q&A feature of Zoom, and I'll make sure to get to them at the end of the talk. Okay, so today I am talking about a book in our rare book collection, The Diary of William Dodd, who served as the U.S. Ambassador to Germany from 1933 until 1937. He had a front row seat to the rise of Adolf Hitler and the rise of the Nazi regime as it expanded its power and as Germany came to embrace the Nazi ideology. Before I talk more about Ambassador Dodd and what he wrote, I want to highlight that this book is part of HMTC's Lewis Posner Memorial Library. This is a lending library that we have in our building. I've just got a couple of photos here of some of the, the library and some of our librarians. Um, the collection includes more than 7,000 volumes and includes one of the largest collections of books related to the Holocaust on Long Island. So if you are doing research on the history of the Holocaust, or if you know people who are doing research on the history of the Holocaust, uh, or on family histories, you may well find that we have some books that would be of use to you. You can go to our website and click resources and library, and you can get to our online catalog, see if we have some material that would be of interest. But we really have a, a super library that is underutilized, I will say. Uh, particularly over the last year and a half with Corona. But please, if you're doing research, we hope that you will think about us. Okay, back to William Dodd. Dodd actually published his diary in 1941. Here's the review in the New York Times book review when it came out. The timing is, I think, notable. 1941, he had stepped down three years earlier, so still his impressions and memory were, um, were clear. But more importantly, the book had a real resonance, resonance in 1941. This shows the situation in Europe, at least geographically, where uh, when the book came out. This was before the U.S. had entered World War II, but Germany had not only invaded and conquered Poland, but it had also con taken control of must, much of Europe. And there were many people in America and in the American government who were urging that America should get into the fight by 1941. There were also many who opposed America's entrance into the war. And I popped up these two political cartoons that I, I found, which I think are, uh, will give you a hint of that opposition, uh, sorry, that, that interest in sparking the war and combating the resistance. The one on my left here, you can see has this, uh, this kind of monster with the swastikas on it, and there's Lindbergh, one of the opponents of American intervention, saying it's Roosevelt, not Hitler, that the world should really fear. Um, so giving you some, a, a sarcastic look at what Lindbergh and those opposed to the entrance into the war were saying. And then another, a similar kind of sarcastic one on the right, relax, Sam, I assure you the express turns off right here and you've got this, the Nazi train racing towards them. And at the appeasement junction, Uncle Sam being told by America first, by those who were opposed, opposing American entrance, that it's fine, that we, they won't be run over by the Nazis, that the Nazis will be diverted onto that sidetrack. So just some of the views that were out there at the time. But Dodd steps in um, with this publication right is this debate is raging in America about should America get involved or should it not? Or to what degree should America get involved? And we know that it actually takes the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th of 1941 to get America into World War II. But the debate was raging already and Dodd publishes his book 
with this inside view of what it was like in Germany to, uh, to help people talk about that decision. Dodd had stepped into the post in 1933 at a particularly challenging time in the relationship between U.S. and Germany. And the historian Charles Beard later wrote an introduction in the diary, or for the published diary, which provided a setup that lay, gave the lay of the land when Dodd was appointed in 1933. He wrote, there we go, among all the diplomats, all the diplomatic missions at the diplomat at at the disposal of President Roosevelt in the spring of 1933, none had more immediate significance for the United States than the embassy in Berlin. None presented more thorny problems of policy, conduct, negotiation, and spirit. In January, Mr. Hitler had become chancellor, that he was a dangerous and ruthless personality was well known everywhere in the spring of 1933, but several varieties of policy in relation with his government were recognized as available. So that was the kind of moment that Dodd stepped into. Dodd was not Franklin Roosevelt's first choice for the position of ambassador to Germany in 1933. In March of 1933, FDR reached out to former Congressman from Ohio, James Cox, Cox to offer him the post. And as you can see here, FDR knew James Cox pretty well, Cox had run for president in 1920 and asked FDR to be his running mate. That team, Cox and FDR, did, did not win the election, obviously, in 1920, but they had remained in contact. But in 1933, when FDR, now the president, reaches out to Cox to say, would you step into this role, Cox recognized that Germany was in an unstable moment, full of violence, that Hitler was actually arresting his own citizens, and Cox says, that's not a place that I want to be. The job remained open for several months as FDR reached out to several other candidates, but they also turned him down. In early June of 1933, at the suggestion of FDR's Commerce, Sec Commerce Secretary, who also was a friend of William Dodd, FDR reached out to Dodd, an American history professor at the University of Chicago, who had studied German history and was fluent in German. Dodd records in his diary that he received the call from President Roosevelt in his office in Chicago on June 8th at 12 noon. FDR then made the offer. Dodd replied that he would need some time to think it over. And FDR's reply, as noted by Dodd in his diary, is two hours. Can you decide in that time? That was FDR's response to Dodd, to give him two hours to make the decision. Dodd ended up agreeing and went to Berlin with his wife, Maddie, and his two adult children, William Jr., who was 27 years old, and Martha, who was 24. Roosevelt emphasized that Dodd needed to be a model of American values in Nazi Germany, but he also told him that his unofficial mandate was to address anti-Semitism in a less than official manner. FDR didn't want to make anti-Semitism the major topic for the government and for his ambassador, but he knew that Dodd, excuse me, he knew that Dodd had to deal with it in some capacity. Um, FDR recognized that the anti-Semitic policies of Hitler were shameful, but FDR did not think America should get too involved at an official level about German government policies. No doubt FDR had no interest in other countries raising voices of concern about how America acted, particularly perhaps in relation to African Americans. At a time when discrimination and segregation were the law of the land in much of the South, uh, much even of the country, FDR did not want other countries stepping on his tail and telling him what to do, and so said the same for Dodd. The diary, interestingly, includes descriptions of several conversations Dodd had before heading to Germany that give a sense about what America knew of Hitler and Nazi Germany in 1933. One meeting that he recounts was held on July 3rd when he met with a group of Jewish leaders in New York that included several New York state judges, the brother of the governor of New York, and Rabbi Stephen Wise, who would later serve as the president of the Zionist Organization of America. Dodd wrote, for an hour and a half, the discussion went on. 
The Germans are killing Jews all the time. They're being persecuted to the point where suicide is common and all Jewish property is being confiscated. That was the message that he was hearing. Dodd reported that he was urged to press for governmental intervention to get the German government to work to stop this persecution. Dodd's response to this group of Jewish leaders, however, probably didn't satisfy them. He summarized it, he said, I insisted that the government could not intervene officially, but assured the members of this conference that I would exert all possible personal influence against unjust treatment of German Jews, and of course, protest against maltreatment of American Jews. I'm guessing that wasn't satisfying, and suggest that Dodd did not see anti-Semitism as a huge problem that he needed to face, at least at the, at the outset. Once in Germany, however, he quickly learned about the ways that the Nazis were treating Jews and became increasingly uh, upset and bothered and, and struggled with it. On September 14, 1933, he described a meeting with the German foreign minister, Baron von Neurath. We talked at length about the Jewish outrages, he wrote. He asked whether we did not have a Jewish problem in the United States. I acknowledged that some people thought so and again repeated my dislike of German brutality. I continued, you cannot expect world opinion of your conduct to moderate so long as eminent leaders like Hitler and Goebbels announced from platforms as in Nuremberg that all Jews must be wiped off the earth. He, von Neurath, did not promise any reforms, much as he seemed to lament the facts. Through the rest of 1933 and into 1934, Dodd describes as uh, Jewish professors and scholars, some of whom he knew through his academic background, were forced from their jobs, which brought anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism of Germany, kind of home to Dodd in a way that he had not understood before. But his larger focus was on assessing Hitler's interest in war and the economic relations between Germany and the United States. On August 2nd, 1934, he described learning about the death of President Hindenburg and the speedy acquiescence as Hitler took on the role of both president and chancellor with the new title of the Fuhrer. He coolly summed up the situation really in two sentences. He wrote, the president of the Third Reich, leader of the National Socialist Party, and Chancellor of the Reich are now all united in one person, the adolescent Austrian who started the putsch business in 1923 and who has killed hundreds of opponents in order to consolidate his power. All this was done in one hour. That's his summary of what happened after President von Hindenburg died. The following day, Dodd described a conference of Baptist leaders that was taking place in Berlin. And again, Dodd succinct and to the point. He wrote, according to the Nazi view, all religions in Germany must be merged into one state church. No such thing as freedom of conscience, excuse the typo, uh, is possible. And local government of any sort is close to treason. Free speech in Germany now is an invitation to be shot. This is August of 1934. He's only been in the country for less than a year, but he's already got a very pessimistic view of the Nazis and of Germany. The Nuremberg rally in September of 1935 was another moment when Dodd shared his sense about the German public. He described a discussion with the new Italian ambassador to Germany, Bernardo Adolico, who had attended the Nazi rally in Nuremberg. And the photo here shows Adelico two years later, along with von Neurath, who I was just talking about. After the Nuremberg rally in 1935, Dodd wrote, his, Adelico's belief is that Germany begins to worship Hitler. I agree to the extent, oops, I agree to the extent of 40% of the people. They consider Hitler a sort of Jesus Christ and show a semi-religious attitude but I'm convinced that the Catholics are not even half Hitlerite. So he was, I think, struggling with how others in Germany could actually support this guy, and he couldn't believe it even as he was watching. Notably absent from Dodd's entry about the Nuremberg rally in September of 1935 
was anything about passage of the Nuremberg Laws that were passed at that rally and that defined who was Jewish and that also took away the citizenship rights from any German Jew. It's a strange absence in hindsight, but perhaps suggests, again, that the Jewish concerns were not foremost in Dodd's mind, regardless of what he had seen over the past few years. Still, you do find in Dodd's diary a directness that no doubt got in the way of his diplomatic role. On November 13th, 1935, he writes, I have not talked with Hitler since February 6th, 1934, more than a year, or Goering since June of the same year. Goebbels had us to dinner in early June of 34. It's also more than a year. It's rather difficult to remain in my position here and never have any of the triumvirate with us socially. They are the governors of Germany and I represent the United States here. But it's so humiliating to me to share hands with known and confessed murderers. In the following months, Dodd wove into his entries various discussions about the upcoming Olympic Games. And by August of 1936, when the Games started, he has regular entries about parties and celebrations in his honor, uh, sorry, in honor of the games. His entry about the closing ceremonies captures the amazing pageantry of the games. He writes, we went this afternoon at 1.30 to the Olympic Games Stadium for the closing contests and final announcements. As we entered the seven mile street at the great star circle in the tear garden, we saw the flag of Germany and many other nations flying from hundreds of tall poles. On both sides of the street, all the way, were uniformed SA and SS soldiers standing close together. There must have been 100,000 soldiers. I have never seen such an elaborate show. I know that a photograph cannot capture what he saw, but I think something maybe, <coughs> excuse me, you get here of, of the crowd, of the scale, of the numbers of people, of the, the pageantry. But Dodd then adds another comment that shows a different view about the Olympics and doesn't hide his disgust. He continues, last night, we went to Dr. Goebel's reception for diplomats and Olympic people on a beautiful island near Dahlem, 15 miles out of town. It was the site of a former Jewish mansion. We shook hands with the host, the man who had helped in June 30th, 1934, to murder Germans who have never been shown to have been guilty of anything but opposition to the Nazi regime. I disliked the handshake as I did with Goering. He's talking there about the Night of the Long Knives in 1934, when Hitler <coughs> ordered the murder of the leaders of the SA and where the SS took over dominance. Uh, Hitler had become in 1934 concerned about the SA, the brown shirts, kind of taking control of him and leading the way, and he wanted to make sure he was in control, so he ordered their killing. And it, it just, it got to Dodd in a way that other things hadn't, where he just saw this, this guy as a murderer and all the leaders of the Nazis as murderers. The diary shows that by 1936, Ambassador Dodd had kind of lost hope for what would happen in Germany. Just two weeks after the end of the Olympic Games, he wrote, nothing is more oppressive to a Democrat, here he means low, lowercase d Democrat, than the situation in Europe. Hitler is the absolute master of Germany's 68 million people. Mussolini is master of Italy's 42 million. And the dominant groups in Poland, Austria, Hungary, and Romania are already fascist. His idea of people being involved in government and having a say in government was uh, just rocked to its core by what he was seeing in Germany and in Europe. A few months later, he described how education had been co-opted by the Nazis. Again, education close to his heart. The guy was an, a professor. He said, I have official reports from different parts of Germany on the subject of general education. All teachers, with one or two exceptions in the Catholic states, must serve several weeks each year in camps where party leaders tell them what to teach. All these youths are taught true interpretations of heroic German history. Nobody is allowed to teach the facts about critical periods when leaders 
made blunders. This is a picture of intellectual Germany. There, that irony or sarcasm at the end. There's nothing intellectual about this, he says. Dodd's open disgust with Hitler and the Nazi regime strained his relation with his superiors in the State Department who wanted him to interact more actively with Nazi leaders. The clash became visible in 1937 when it was on the front page of the New York Times. The major issue was about attending the annual Nazi party rally that were being held every summer in Nuremberg. By 1937, Dodd had been avoiding this event for several years, preferring not to give any endorsement to the Nazis party, Nazi party by his very attendance. The State Department, however, wanted Dodd to attend so as to avoid giving offense to the German government. After increasing the pressure on Dodd to attend for several years, in 1937, Dodd actually arranged to visit the United States on vacation during the time when the Nazi Party rally or the Nazi Party Congress was going to take place, thus avoiding what he thought was gonna be the conflict of the State Department telling him to go and him not wanting to go. But the State Department decided to urge a replacement, some underling, somebody else to attend in Dodd's place and to represent America. But Don, Dodd strongly urged against that, again, not wanting to give any word of support or sign of support to the Nazi party. But Dodd's advice against sending a representative was overridden by his superiors and the State Department allowed its overruling of Dodd's position to become public in Washington and thus the news in the New York Times. Shortly after that humiliation, Dodd began planning to resign, which he finally did in November of 1937. Dodd had become so openly critical of the Nazis and, that Hit and Hitler that Hitler actually gave him no farewell audience, not even a meeting to say goodbye. The German foreign minister also omitted any, the customary dinner that was generally provided to departing diplomats. And the German press did not even mention his departure. The German press completely under Nazi party control, but they did not mention that the US ambassador was, had resigned and headed back to America. In a statement Dodd made upon his return to the US, Dodd confessed that he had found representing the United States in Hitler's Berlin a hopeless task. His statement, he said, in a vast region where religious freedom is denied, where intellectual initiative and discovery are not allowed, and where race hatreds are cultivated, what can a representative of the United States do? Dodd was replaced by Hugh Wilson, the Assistant Secretary of State. Oops, don't have his picture. The Assistant Secretary of State and a career diplomat who was seen as someone who would be less anti-Hitler, who could interact with Hitler and the Nazis. In the end, FDR would recall Hugh Wilson just a few months later in November of 1938 after the so-called Kristallnacht pogrom of November 9th and 10th and leave the post of US ambassador to Germany empty until the end of the war. In hindsight, I think we can say that Dodd actually kept to his moral values, to his um, inner voice, and he did not want to endorse the Nazi party in any way. And he became appalled that other government leaders were willing to do things that endorsed them. He wanted to provide no legitimacy from the United States for Nazi Germany. And it's really a position that stands as notable. It didn't stop Nazi, the Nazis from uh, starting the Holocaust. It didn't stop Hitler from gaining support but it was an effort by one man to try and undermine Hitler. Anyway, I will stop there. I hope that my talk gives you a sense of what's in this diary, really a lovely book and worth taking a look at, a great source of information about that period from 1933 to 1937. Uh, it is, as I mentioned, just one of 7,000 books that is in HMTC's library, and I hope you will feel encouraged to come visit our library and benefit from the collection. Okay, thanks for watching. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A window. But let me just add these announcements before I get to those questions. I wanna make sure you know that we have our annual golf outing 
on Monday, this coming Monday at 12 noon at the Meadowbrook Club. If you're interested in joining us, I think there's still room. Just give us a call and um, you can arrange a way to join us. Uh, I will be back for my next Curator's Corner next Wednesday on August 3rd, back at 11 a.m. Sorry, going back to the original time when I will talk about a children's book in our collection that shows how hate was taught to the youngest members of German society. It is a colorful, upbeat looking book and yet full of dark, uh, disturbing lessons for children. And one more program to mention, on Monday, August 16th at 6 p.m., we'll be holding a book discussion with Professor Edward Westerman. This is a rescheduled talk about his recent book, Drunk on Genocide. We had originally scheduled the program back in June, but we had some technical problems and were not able to hold it at the time. And so we have now re rescheduled it and glad to have it on our calendar. I hope you will join us to talk with Professor West Westerman about his research on the way alcohol served to lubricate the gears of genocide. Okay, let me stop sharing my screen and take a look at what questions you've got. Uh, yes, somebody is mentioning The Garden of the Beasts, uh, the book by Eric Larson, a great book about, um, about Dodd, about his family, a lot about his daughter, Martha, but I agree completely, a very interesting book. Um, somebody asked, did people find out that Dodd was keeping a journal while he was in Germany? If they did and were able to read it, did his writings get him in trouble? Um, I'm sure nobody probably doubted the fact that he was keeping a private journal. This was not unusual at the time, but uh, this was not, it was not available for public reading. Nobody was, saw it until he published it. And of course the publication probably included some bit of editing. So we're not getting everything that, that Dodd wrote, but we're getting what he decided in 1941, he wanted to share with us. But his writings did not get him in trouble. What got him in trouble is he was not hesitant about saying what he thought. And so, you know, he was not shy about sharing his uh, displeasure with Hitler and Goebbels and Goring. And so the fact that he went, you know, years without seeing the leaders of Germany, even though he was the US representative, that's a sign that maybe not in trouble, but he wasn't functioning well as a diplomat, but he was saying what we now look back on and say, and, and we're glad that he did it. Uh, did God, Dodd continue to make his anti-Nazi views known during the war? You know, that's a very interesting question. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know, Felice. I'll have to look that up. I'm not sure what happened to him uh, and whether he became a, a voice in support of the war. I assume he did, but I, I honestly don't know. I apologize. Uh, was there any close relationship between Professor William Dodd and William Shirer? They both seem to publish books on the experience in post-war Germany. Uh, I'm sure they knew each other. I'm, I don't know how well they knew each other. And uh, in very different posi positions, I think, Dodd really, nobody else had that view that he did of, of being right there. Although I guess some, some of the journalists uh, might well have also, but n they wouldn't have had the, the access that Dodd would have and wouldn't have had access to what was going on back in the State Department in the United States either. Um, are any of these books available for borrowing. Uh, oh, and somebody's pointing out that I said the wrong date. I said August 3rd when I mean next when next Wednesday, August 4th is my next Curator's Corner. Thank you for that. Uh, the books in our rare book collection, which I think there's about, uh, well, about 100 books in the rare collection, including this diary, they are not available for borrowing, but the other books in our collection, the great majority, are. And again, you can find our online catalog if you're interested by going to our website www.hmtcli.org. And then you can click under resources and library. It's a few clicks down, but you should find the catalog for the Lewis Posner Memorial Library. Okay, well, thanks very much for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you at some of our other programs soon. Be well, thank you, bye-bye.